Everybody has a story, and every story needs to be heard. On this podcast, we are talking with each member of the General Conference Leadership Council. I'm your host, Alyssa Truman, and this is ANN Profiles. Today, I'm here with Dr. Peter Landless. He is the director of the Health Ministries Department of the General Conference of Seventh-day Adventists. Hello, Dr. Landless. Hi, Lisa. You know, the funny thing is, I said Peter Landless, but I don't know if I've ever called you Peter. When you prayed for me, you did. I did. Well, <clears throat> that might be the only time I've ever called you Peter. You've always been Dr. Landless. Call me Peter. <laughs> um, I realize that in this building, there's certain people... Um, probably because of how he was raised, partially, um, but also because of a, a certain level of respect that I feel towards them, that I, I, I feel weird calling them by their first name. And I, I realized that you must be one of them because you've always just been Dr. Landless. But I will I will maybe even try to attempt Peter today. You, you're welcome. <laughs> and of course, it comes with the territory and probably because you think I'm very old. I, well, you're older than me. We can, that's that's a safe to say well, one. You're older than me. I could put that into more perspective. Much older. Well, than I'm you. not. I'm not putting that there, though. I'm not putting that there. It is what so, it is. Um, I'm sure that we'll, we'll figure out that much older as we proceed, as we start talking about your life. But you are a doctor, and your specialty is health ministries in this building. Um, which is a good thing. It makes a lot of sense, I guess, right? But we see your face, we read your articles, but most of us don't actually know who is Peter Landless. So today we get to find out who you are and more about your life story and how God has brought you to where you are today. So let's start at the very beginning. Um, We don't have to talk about years, but where were you born? And tell me a little bit about your mom and dad. Mm-hmm. I was born in Johannesburg, South Africa. And um, my parents met at the end of the war, the Second World War, not the first. <laughs> the Second World War. And uh, my brother was born approximately four years before I was. And uh, our parents moved to South Africa. They met in Egypt. My father was British. My mother was Greek, born in Egypt. And they um, came to... What were they doing in Egypt? My father was there as part of the British Army. Okay. Uh, And my mother, her family had lived there for many years. Okay. In fact, as I say, she was born there. And um, my grandfather worked a lot, not only across... North Africa, Egypt, Sudan, but across a lot of Europe. He was a polyglot, spoke many languages, European languages, and uh, did a lot of business in the textile industry. Parents met in Egypt. They were introduced to the truths of this church uh, starting at that time. In fact, Uh, Elder Neil Wilson was uh, instrumental in my mom's family getting to know about the love of Jesus as we know it in the Seventh-day Adventist Church. Amen. So uh, it's been an an interesting journey. They then went to South Africa and I was born there. And um, parents were new, first-generation Adventists. And both embraced this truth with all their hearts. Um, engagement in the church, involvement, steeped themselves in the, in the Bible, spirit of prophecy, writings of Ellen White. Our home was always blessed with, from our earliest days, my little friend. You wouldn't know about that, but that was in, it used to be published on papyrus. <laughs> it did not. <laughs> no. um, I read Our Little Friend. Oh, well, then so. <laughs> you're older than I thought you were. Anyway. Oh, I'm not sure that's good. <laughs> but mine wasn't on papyrus. No, nor was mine. 
<clears throat> but then my little friend in the primary treasure, mm -hmm. and then it went on and to the guide and um, Insight was a wonderful magazine that came out when I was a teenager and at, uh, in my early university days. The Youth's Instructor, of course, the Adventist Review and Sabbath Herald, which would come every Friday. That was great timing. It was amazing. Uh, you know, only so our mail system could be so reliable today. <laughs> The churches, uh, our, our church life was core and intrinsic to who we were. Uh, my dad was an elder in the church. My mom was engaged in all kinds of things, Sabbath school. So my childhood was a wonderful time uh, where I was, I breathed, ate, slept, uh, the message that we have. But most importantly, was introduced to uh, to Jesus at a very early age. How do you see that you were introduced to Jesus? Like, yes, you go to Sabbath school, but like, did he become your friend as a kid? He did. How? Mainly through my parents and especially my mom's influence. Because she spent a lot of time helping us to understand and to and prayed with us my father did too but he was a little more distant on this issue and and in general i mean he was a very loving father but we spent a lot of time with mom um dad went to work every day when my mom worked she worked from home as a music teacher piano teacher so she had a glass door put in between where the piano was, where she was teaching, and where my brother and I needed to do our homework. <laughs> so she could see what we were doing, uh, which didn't leave a lot of latitude for, uh, for not doing it. But it was, it was her influence. For example, we had the Uncle Arthur's Bible story. The blue Bible story The books. blue, ten volumes. Yes. And um, I still have the original set. Do you really? I do. And it's something which uh, I cherish. My mom would make sure that we would be ready for school, have breakfast. And it was in those days, we didn't have a school bus. We walked to school. So you had to give that. I have to tell you, it was uphill both ways. I was actually just going to ask you <laughs> it that. It was uphill both ways. <laughs> Um, no, it was it was it in was the a snow. pleasant walk. <laughs> no snow, um, but she said to us, "If you don't get up on time and get your breakfast, you can go to school hungry, but you will not go to school without a hedge around you." That hedge mm. was the reading of the word and prayer. Wow! So that was that was a daily, every morning thing, and it uh, it was amazing and. My mom also prayed the prayer. She said, Lord, make them. She, f she first said, we're here to spend and be spent in his cause. Wait, can you repeat that? We're here so that we can spend and be spent in his cause. In other words, we are to be dedicated to his service. I love that. So we spend our energy and we are spent at the end of the day when it's <laughs> you're spent and the end of the day meaning at the end of your life you've done it in his cause she also prayed lord make him to be a missionary in the four corners of the earth that was a regular prayer um which i've never forgotten so it was a um you asked the question, did he become a friend then? Absolutely, because I remember um, the stewardship director of the conference coming around. I was a kid and uh, talking about covetousness. Um, I'll never forget he was a quite an imposing fellow with a very sort of blue shade beard, even when he'd freshly shaved. I mean, very very nice man, but 
the preaching of stewardship did not come because we love Jesus, but don't be covetous. But I remember writing out my covenant, my pledge of what I was going to pay of my one shilling and six pence pocket money and how this would be tithed, and, which was a wonderful practice for me. And he was a good man. But my mother epitomized the Christ-like attitude mm. that we give and we return because we are his first, because he loves us. And that's why you do it. So, so th that's where it became. And, you know, it's interesting. Um, I'll never forget my first Bible, which I don't have anymore. I, it's, but it was worn out. And I would do the Sabbath school lesson every day. And um, my parents were heavily involved in our church, in our congregation. And there were times, every six or eight months, they really were busy. And I think they were preempting what we talk about so much today of uh, burnout. They yeah. were preempting that, and from time to time, they would just take a, a weekend where they would not go to church. It was a day of rest and gladness, literally. But I said to them, I, I want to go to church. They said, well, you can. I said, I'll walk to church. Because I didn't want to put them in the embarrassing of dropping their child situation off. of dropping their child off. I mean, here are the leaders of the church. It was, and it was, it was not a regular occurrence. But so I would walk the five miles, six miles. I loved it. Get to church, enjoy it, walk back. And um, it was... It was that important to me. Hmm. And uh, so, yeah, it, it was something. And I never had the privilege of going to Adventist schools. We had some. Right ne at the church, there was a church school. But we couldn't afford that. And there wasn't a bus service. And uh, my father gave up a great amount to keep Sabbath uh, from the work point of view. And so he took less well-paying positions so that he could have Sabbath off. And uh, we owe him that huge debt of gratitude because firstly, the Lord never let us down. But it was a sacrifice that he made and taught us a great deal. So all of those things you ask, was he my friend? Was Jesus? Is Did he become my friend then? Absolutely. Yeah. You know, I... I love that even if your parents didn't go, that that you had this connection that like you couldn't imagine not going. But I also love that your parents started showing you at a very early age that you can be completely dedicated, but that sometimes you need to come apart and rest a while. Oh, yeah. And I think for those of us who work for the church, um, we struggle with this. Absolutely. I, I know that people in your office have talked to me a few times about the fact that I need to actually use my vacation days. Um, we struggle because, you know, we're doing God's work and we're, you know, and we feel like this sense of urgency, which is important. But if we're not healthy because we have pushed ourselves so hard, that's also not going to be great for the mission. I, so I love that that this was mirrored to you at a very young age and you maybe didn't even fully comprehend it until later in life. But I don't think it was something I've ever really been shown. And that's, that was a beautiful takeaway that you were given as a young man. It was and one which I haven't practiced enough. So I, I guess we're all still learning. Well, <laughs> you know, Jesus said to the disciples, come ye yourselves apart and rest a while. And um, my colleagues are trying to teach me that. Why do you think that's so hard for us? I mean, I know this isn't your life story necessarily, but why is it so hard for us to rest? 
I think it's because we expect more of ourselves than God does. Hmm. And it also takes the need to realize that God cares more about this work than I do. But also, as importantly, that health depends on balance of adequate rest, sleep, exercise, all those things which need to be actually scheduled in. And vacation like that, and this is where I have heard, and it's a bit late in the day, but it's the truth. One needs to, the people who really get a huge amount done and stay happy about doing it are those who schedule their vacation days well into the calendar. That's what we need to do. Yeah, I'm very bad at that. We aren't going to talk about my vaca- my lack of vacation this year. We're just going to ignore that, and we're going to keep going with your story now. Um, yeah, sorry. Now I'm, I'm thinking about the fact that we really have a lot of, we have a long way to go. Yeah. And I, I love what you said, that that God cares more about it than we do, but I think sometimes we somehow think that we have to do it all. Yeah. He, he's got this. <laughs> you know, he has. And, and one of the fun things is I look back on my childhood. We had two beautiful big dogs. One was an English setter and one was an Irish setter. I don't Ooh, know if you know beautiful. These, they are beautiful dogs. And we would go walking Sabbath afternoons, take them down to the river, and dogs would get in and swim and chase sticks, and it was a lot of fun. But they got older, and the dogs had to be put down at one point. But as they were really getting old and had arthritis and cataracts, and I would every, it was part of my job. And that's the other thing I thank my parents for, is we had tasks to do. You have the pets, but you cleaned up after them. You fed them, changed the water, did all the good things. Cleaning up after two big dogs, uh, you can imagine. <laughs> but that was it was all helpful. But I would each evening, because we had a, a room uh, which uh, was it was a set of rooms. One of the, they were storerooms at the out, outhouses, mm-hmm. and uh, so the dogs would sleep there. And there was it was two half doors, so they could leave the door open. They could get in and out as they needed. And I remember going to check that their blankets were all together and everything was fine. And I would pat them on the head and say, if I don't see you in the morning, I'll see you in heaven. Of course, I believed then that dogs went to heaven. I'm not sure today that they don't. Of course, that could be uh, misconstrued by the theologians who may ever listen to what we we say. We don't need to worry about them. (laughs) But I don't. In this conversation. (laughs) I don't. But, you know, that was to me the realistic. Um, And the other thing, and sadly, even as we work in the kind of setting we do, full time for the church, the urgency of Jesus' second coming at times was more real to me then than it is even now. Hmm. The news is so much more compelling. It's so in your face all the time. It's 24-7. There wasn't that kind of news when I was a kid growing up. I mean, we would listen to the 7 o'clock morning news, the 1 o'clock news. My dad was a bit of a news junkie. And then 7 o'clock at night, 11 o'clock at night, those were the news uh, casts. Here we are connected 24-7, and we see that the world is in the greatest mess it's probably ever been, but it's also very highly communicated. And I think that one of the things that was very helpful to me was this realization within my home setting, through the kind of home our parents gave us, that uh, this is all very real. And we have a work to do. We also have an opportunity And that opportunity was very often revealed. I was very blessed at school. Um, School was fun for me. 
And, uh, but the problem was going to a non Seventh day Adventist school. There were a lot of Christian principals at the school I went to. It was a government school. But at that time, there was a strong emphasis of, on Christian religion in schools. The prize givings were always on a Friday evening. I could never go. And every year I would get the prize at, at the end of the school, you know, the class prize. I had to make the decision I was not going to go. And after the first, and it, it, it wasn't difficult. You know, it, and there were times, I mean, I remember when I was in high school and uh, I was leading the, the school band and um, they would have their big functions on a Sabbath. I could hear the band playing. No. Yeah. But I wasn't there. But, you know, it, it, was, it was not a bad experience. Of course, people would say, so you're a Seventh-day adventurer? <laughs> I've heard that one. <laughs> no, no, Seventh-day Adventist, a Seventh-day inventor. What do you invent? <laughs> but all of that uh, was, was actually very key in formation. So, so many things come together. So, you liked school. I love You've it. had this, this beautiful background um, of having a, not just religion, but a spirituality that was imparted to you. Absolutely. Um, when did you know medicine? Growing up, my mother would encourage me to be a pastor. Okay. And um, I was quite okay with that. And um, she had plans, not plans, she, she suggested things for my brother to do and she felt I was going to be the pastor. And um, I was good with that until about, I don't know what you'd call it here, grade eight, grade seven, grade eight. And I started to think, you know what, I think I'd like to do either law or medicine. And um, for some reasons which I hesitate to mention on something that may air, uh, I felt it better not to do law. I would have loved it. I mean, there are components to it which are just fascinating. But I was... It, it's okay. I, you, I, you want medicine. I, I gravitated <laughs> much more to medicine because I also enjoyed the sciences. I enjoyed that. And um, I then started to have a struggle. Should I be a pastor? Should I be a doctor? And... Um, it took a lot of thought, a lot of thinking, prayer. And I would also wanted to do what my mother would be happy with. And she was she was just the most amazing person. If if it would make us happy, it, she was happy. And I started to read more of the spirit of prophecy and to read also medical ministry, where she talks about the blended ministry where physicians have a responsibility to take care of the spiritual component of their patient. So it's a blended ministry. It's not just one or t'other. And that appealed to me. And um, so at the end of the day, I did medicine. And six years after, or five years after starting working as a mission doctor in the church, I was ordained to the gospel ministry. So I became a pastor and a doctor. <laughs> so in the end, your mom? It was both. <laughs> and she lived to see that, which was a lot of fun. So I know in when you become a doctor, you don't just generally become a doctor. You have an area of specialty, mm -hmm. generally. What was the area of specialty you chose and why? Well, I have three specialties okay. and one subspecialty. All three of them. Okay. Well, I guess you get I all of them. <laughs> I started off uh, in family medicine. My in, grandfather in, was family. In medicine. general practice, and went and and the reason for that is simple. Uh, the brethren approached me and tapped me on the shoulder and said, "We need somebody to go to this place. We have nobody." 
I was not prepared. Where was this place? In uh, Fixburg in South Africa, which is right on the border of Lesotho, a little okay. landlocked country. We have a mission hospital just about 20 miles from that into Lesotho. So this was a town where we had a medical practice, family practice, and um, the person who was working there was going to be leaving. And um, so a colleague said, well, if you'll come with me, I'll go. Friend, Seventh Adventist friend, very bright guy, very committed. And at the last minute, he pulled out. He went to specialize in ophthalmology. And there was no one to go. My better judgment said to me, you don't go either, because I needed to do additional training to go into a family practice without additional pediatrics, OBGYN, mm -hmm. anesthetics, a number of things. It was crazy. We worked through this all, and ultimately we said, well, um, best if this is the Lord calling, we'll go. And um, oh, You keep saying we. Is there a we at this point? Well, in my fifth year... I had the privilege to meet the love of my life, and we got married. I was going to say, you keep saying we, so I'm going to definitely have to bring this in oh, no, here. <laughs> the we, it, uh, I, I met Roz, and uh, we got married when I was in fifth year, and um, so that meant I had to finish the sixth and an internship, and then we went. She, at the time, Roz, is a, an organic chemist and had done maths and computer science. She was working in uh, research, and uh, the colleagues at the university in the medical school had gotten to know her because she was doing uh, certain drug level analyses for them on a special chromatography um, technique. You just said a lot of big words there that I didn't know. What is, anyway, chroma what is chromatography? Chromatography. Well, it's it's a it's a way of analyzing uh, a level of a chemical. Okay. In the blood, looking at how far it travels on a specific um, uh, medium. So she was doing this for the neurology department. And when I finished medicine, I was very blessed. Um, I, I got plum jobs in, in turn, in, as an intern, the best in the teaching complex. And... Towards the end of that, started to get offers. We'd like you to come be do a residency in neurology, cardiology, internal medicine, whatever it would be. It would first be internal medicine. But then there were those, the neurology professor said, we'd like. And so it went. And when they heard we were going to be going to the mission field, they said, you're crazy. Now, were you at an Adventist school? No. no. So you're, no. you're at a, a public, public university. university, and you're like, no, I'm going to go to this little mission exactly. outpost. And, and they said, you're crazy. You've got the world at your feet. And they said, secondly, and I wondered how much they wanted me or they wanted my wife, <laughs> but they said, if you want to go and bury yourself there, that's bad enough, but to take her and deprive us of her as well, these were the words. And these were top-notch professors, teachers, and they, they, interestingly, when I went back to specialize 11 years later, they were still there. They all became my patient. It was a most wonderful, privileged opportunity to share and minister to those who had taught me hmm. the best you could get, teachers and the physicians and clinicians. But there was a lot of pushback saying to me, you know, Stay with us. We have a career for you. Medicine is going to be what you're going to enjoy. Well, it has been, and I loved every minute of it, but it wasn't the way they thought it would be. <laughs> that is often the case, isn't it? So the we, we got married and we went, went to serve to the, in the mission. The How mission. long did you serve there? Eleven years. Uh, five years after we got there, uh, we were blessed with our first child, and then two years after that, the second one. Um... It was an amazing time. We were really blessed in our home, in our work, in our church. We had the privilege of planting two churches, building two churches, um, and 
God's Spirit resurrected the church where we were working in the town, people should never doubt that a blended ministry works in helping people understand and know Jesus. Hmm. So it was, uh, it was, a, it was a, a blessed, fun, busy, hugely busy, <laughs> well, It wonderful sounds like time. you were slightly busy over it there. It was. What would you say was one of the biggest challenges that you had while you were serving there for 11 years? Being alone for much of the time, uh, not having a, a colleague to work with from the point of view that it was weekend after weekend after weekend, that was probably the biggest challenge we faced. And then we did have the privilege of getting a very good partner and uh, became good friends and co-workers, co-caretaking of the church. And uh, so that was a great blessing. But, but the, the loneliness and the extendedness of being on call all the time, that would be one. The other one would be, and although the Lord never let us down. The other challenge is when you're not adequately prepared. What I did while I was there, I did my first specialty in medicine. In, 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 I went and did a three-year part-time specialization in family medicine, which came with a degree, and, uh, but it was uh, mainly distance learning, but you had to go and do practicals every mm -hmm. four months certain amount of time so that was a really worthwhile thing and also very helpful in in giving one even more confidence and being better able to serve what I will add though I'll never forget as we accepted to go and as I was Roz went ahead of me a week or so and I was driving down on January 1 1976 and I'd been up all night at the end of a retractor for a kidney transplant procedure surgery and as the sun rose and shone within the windows of the operating room uh, it was the most amazing experience the surgeon who was an outstanding surgeon one of my heroes and mentors connected the kidney and the blood supply to the donor kidney and the kidney started to produce urine right there not that doesn't always happen because there's a sometimes a shutdown takes place and regeneration of cells needs to take place but and it was as if it was something saying to me the creator of life is still there hmm. And as I drove down to the place we were going to serve, I made a covenant with the Lord. I said, I'm doing this, but please let there never be something that you and I can't handle together. I was scared. And I had good reason to be. I did not want to mess up on a life. And the Lord never let, it, let me down. Never. And um, so it, uh, the challenges, that's what I was leading to. One, of working solo a lot. Two, one's got to be adequately trained. And I always make that recommendation to people who are considering going into a lifetime of service in any place is to be adequately prepared, adequately trained. Um, and um, fortunately, I, right from the get-go, uh, could go across to the mission hospital where I worked with more senior and trained physicians to learn techniques and surgical techniques. And I was superbly well-trained by God's grace at, at the best medical school probably in the continent when I studied. And one or two may question that who come from other medical schools, but it was, it was regarded as one of the top in the world mm. at that time. So theoretical training was top-notch, but it's to have the adequate training to be in a, 
uh, a multi um, disciplinary practice as a family physician is a family physician uh, you know people say what do you do oh, I'm a family physician oh, what do you do I'm a cardiologist oh a cardiologist I would tell you that a good family medicine physician is rare and is like gold because they're the ones who guide and and help the quality of life in patients could be over a lifetime and I saw that I got to know people so well got to know them got to know their homes their grandparents their parents their children they would call me in the night I would know exactly where they lived and I it wasn't a problem you remember their history so um, the training as I said I did additional training but right from the get go was intent on doing that learning to do tonsillectomies properly anesthetics properly I'd had all the theory but now so that all made a very big difference and uh, we were very blessed had a wonderful professional time and spiritual time and family time it was great so you were there for 11 years 11 years and then it sounds like you came back to the university yeah to do internal medicine that was okay. the love of my life apart from my wife <laughs> internal medicine was you know I, i'm I, glad Roz well Roz knows that now <laughs> she's known she, it for 50 she's years first, not secondary so um i and partly was stimulated in that direction because as a family physician as what we would call a gp a general practitioner you get to a point where you work with your patient but then you have to refer and you should which means that if you're a fixer you don't get to fix and um I thought that, and, and it's what I enjoyed, was... Fixing. The internal medicine component. Surgeons are fixers. But they have to wade through blood and all sorts of stuff to do that. Uh, internal medicine, internists tend to do it. Uh, they they more the thinking. Cognitive. Not that surgeons don't think because, you know, the people who... They're amazing people. Having said that, and then, of course, what right from my fourth year in medicine which is early student clinical days cardiology was what appealed to me so but you had to do internal medicine first I went back and did internal medicine yes back to the university then to cardiology All right so you have family medicine internal medicine cardiology and then you have a subspecialty you said in nuclear cardiology what does that mean that means the use of radioisotopes in the imaging of the heart Okay. So it's it's using and and why one uses radioisotopes because as they um, change state, they give out photons which are light energy. So it's um, in the decay process, light sent out that's captured on a special monitor and transformed into an image. Now, what's very helpful is that, for example. In looking at the heart, it goes into the, you can see what where it's taken up in the heart muscle. That helps you to infer how the blood supply is of all the areas of the heart. And if there's an area which is not getting enough blood flow, it lights up or it doesn't light up on the image. And of course, over the years, it has so changed. Right now, that kind of uh, imaging can give you huge amounts of information about risk stratifying of a patient um, the chances of getting a heart attack whether your treatment has been adequate whether putting in a stent or a bypass surgery has been successful so there's um, huge uh, possibilities with it it's a fascinating field hmm. so you you went back to school for all this, how many more years does this put you in school? Well, it was three and a half into internal medicine, then into cardiology, another two and a half. So it was six, um, seven to start, 13. Plus then I stayed on in cardiology. I was in, firstly, I was invited into cardiology. I hadn't 
told the professor that that's what I wanted to do. But I got a message after I passed my internal medicine exam saying, there's a job for you in cardiology if you want it. There's only one. He wants to know this week. Well, I thought, well, it's just what I want. <laughs> and I took it. And, um, of course, that led to, to other interesting things because every Sabbath there was a, a grand round. But the grand round was teaching for all the cardiologists in Johannesburg, private, academic, um, everyone was there. So the, for the first week, I excused myself to the professor and said, I'm sorry, I'm going to church on Saturday. He said, that's okay. I said, I go to church on Saturdays. He said, that's fine. I thought that was easy. Two weeks later, he said, I see you were not here this last week. I said, I did say I go to church on Saturdays. He said, that's going to be a problem. Because this is a key component of training in cardiology. All the most interesting cases are shown. Everything is is discussed and there's presentations and it's a, it's a learning place. I said, well, if, I, if it's either to come to that or not to do cardiology, I'll have to choose not to do cardiology. No, 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 he said, we would like you to stay, but you'll be the poor for it. I said, well, will you give me the chance? He said, absolutely. Hmm. He said, I'll be watching you. Well, fast forward, he also became a patient of mine with a heart problem when his developed, and he was a, a very, very selective individual. He was also an atheist. But we had the most wonderful opportunities to talk about that and about... I mean, he would say to me, he said, you amaze me, he said, you are so evidence-based, you will only use the approaches which are shored up and undergirded by good medical science. He said, but you believe all that stuff in the Bible? I said, I do. I said, because... He made the science. We had many conversations about that, but it was, um, it was a very wonderful friendship that developed over years. And uh, it was a great privilege. Mm. I love that. I mean, you talked about how, you know, you were able to kind of put your faith in with your practice. Mm -hmm. And I love that even your teachers, they saw this. And, and you weren't even willing to sacrifice to get more knowledge, which in theory would have been helpful, um, but that you trusted that God would give you what you needed because he had never let you down in the past. He didn't. So after this run, we'll say, here at this um, university and stuff, where do you go after this? Well, interestingly, just, just a very brief thing that you should know, perhaps, and that is early in my time in the mission field, in the, my first, our first appointment, I was called up to go into the army. And that caused a significant problem because there was nobody really to come and work in the practice. So I was then given a deferment for a year, and then came back to the to the practice and then had to make arrangements. I was called up for the next intake, <coughs> which became two years instead of one. And in that time period, I was also involved in a, in a very significant landmine accident, which um, my driver was killed. Um, I lost a portion of my finger and I had hand surgery and 
But again, and why I mention that now, because you're going to you're asking me what happened after the university cardiology and so on. I went out on a Sabbath to a very remote area where I'd been seeing patients each week because there were, there were no hospitals for the local population. I promised to go back. And um, there was a lot of rain. It was The weather was terrible. Gave me a bodyguard, uh, landmine uh, engineers to sweep the roads for landmines. And uh, anyway, on the way back, three large mines were placed, two anti-tank mines and what we called a cheese mine. I mean, the hole that blew in the ground was <laughs> three, four times the size of this table and as deep. Um, but interestingly, I was thrown out of the vehicle despite safety belt, etc., I called my mom after this event. Roz was down in Pittsburgh. I called her as well. But when I called my mom, she said to me, you've been in an accident. I said, well, how do you know? She said, because at 12.15, I was compelled to my knees to pray for you. Landmines were detonated at 12.15. In Fixburg, they'd finished the service. They were about to have a potluck. And they said, well, I think we should pray for Peter. 12.15. So that actually had set the trajectory as well. It had actually not only set it, it... The fact that it was without any doubt in my mind that my life was spared. My driver died 10 days later, sitting closer to me than you are. It was during that, it was a few years after that, I was ordained to the gospel ministry, went back to specialize, and then came a call once I was was well entrenched in, I was pastoring a church, Uh, Despite all the other stuff that we were doing, I was in an academic situation. I had research, clinical work. I was teaching, researching, writing. Uh, I sat on the union committee. I was chairing our church's health work, uh, health professionals um, group, which was doing a lot of good work. And um, I was asked if I would be willing to come to the general conference as the health director. Oh, that was very quick. Well, no, I've, I've given it to you in a very... Because <laughs> <laughs> you said what happened after the university. I mean, was, I guess I thought that, like, yeah, there was a lot of years there in my mind. Well, that I, if you go from 1994 to 2000, it's six years. Okay. I guess it is. Which, is, which, <laughs> which passes in a moment. Especially when we're talking, so you said So you said what, what happened? <laughs> That's what happened next. So you were called to the GC. But we had been working, as I said, we pastored a church for 15 years. Firstly, with a, a very wonderful colleague who, when he heard we were coming back to specialize, he said, I want you to help me pastor the church. I said, I'm going to be very busy. He said, we can do it together. And we had an, we had an amazing time. What do you think um, the benefit was to you? Because both of those are are busy jobs, okay? You, but what benefit do you, you think? think that you... <laughs> I do think. <laughs> Actually, I don't even think. I, I pretty much know that this is going to be a fact. What do you think was the benefit, though, to being able to be involved in pastoral ministry while also being part of a healing ministry? Huge. Huge. Because it gives more purpose. Of course there's purpose to the healing ministry. Um, we all need healing. We're all broken. The patients who would come to my office, who would come to the hospital, and the people who sit in the pews, including myself on the Sabbath, were broken. And it was just wonderful to... And, and medicine is a very absorbing... All careers are absorbing. But I want to tell you that being a little Pauline 
you know, like Paul would say, if anyone's been shipwrecked, I've been shipwrecked, everyone. Medicine is all consuming. It just sucks you in and and having that additional facet, dimension, not only in praying with patients, but also in in sharing the gospel story and 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 all which you can do with patients in a very ethical careful way but to be part of a church as a family which we were Roz the girls myself Roz is a an accomplished organist the girls are musicians sing we I, I pastored the church preach teach every sabbath was a celebration and it's it also the blended ministry we we for years didn't have a paid pastor in our church hmm. which grew from about 150 to close to 3 330 people um i used to joke and say well most pastors are paid to be good i'm good for nothing because <laughs> <laughs> we didn't get a salary but um, it, it was just a, an involvement and engagement with people. And what made it more, in my opinion, by God's grace, successful was having the credibility of a physician teaching spiritual things. And Ellen White talks about it, that people will listen because they will consider that a physician has that additional background mm -hmm. and that's true it's absolutely true it doesn't make us better ministers but it gives if you particularly if you're working with a pastor who is who embraces comprehensive health ministry you've got an ideal blend mm. and we would be crisscrossing the city and in the evenings visiting our parish in different hospitals he would go to one side, I would go to another side. And this is all in between uh, the work that was going on. And I don't, uh, you, you ask what is the benefit? It gives ongoing purpose and energizes your ministry in both fields. Mm. So you get a call, um, 2000, you yeah. said. So was this during GC session? Mm -hmm. Did you know your name was on the radar? I got a, an inkling of that just a few months before, and I said, don't even think about it. <laughs> like, no, just... No, I, I, I wasn't rude, but, I, 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 but it was... I can't imagine you being rude, actually. Uh -huh. I mean, I'm sure that... <laughs> I don't know. It's, it's possible. <laughs> I think you could be firm, but I'm not sure I could see you being rude. Well, There's a difference. You're very kind. <laughs> I appreciate that. No, it, um, I, I really... We were... In a pastoral situation, I was in a teaching situation. I chaired the board of trustees of a psychiatric hospital, chaired the board of our Adventist Professional Health and Humanitarian Services, um, had good research going. I'd been awarded a hypertension prize for research, and they were, it was, it was just wonderful. So, what made you say yes? Well, then, then a call came through. Um, the nominating committee sat and I got a phone call saying this and I was completely confused and um, we of course Ros and I talked and prayed about it and I spoke with some key close friends and nobody discouraged me and some of these key close friends were cynical about the kind of going full t and these were both church people some of my non-church friends colleagues one of them she was a lovely Jewish girl she said what a waste of a good physician of a, of a good clinician to go and I said Karen I, I thank you but I'm still considering it <laughs> The others said, really think this is what you should do. This is what the Lord's calling you to do. You must do it. And um, initially we were reticent, very reticent. 
but given a few days to think, which we did, we believe that, and we also said, Lord, if this is what you want, you open the way. We'd been through some experiences before that where I had been headhunted for a very good position here in the U.S. Um, everything was set. And just before we, and we had just sold our house to make the move something came up, a glitch came up in the immigration processes and they said, sorry, we're not going to be able to do it at this time. It was then that we decided we will not move from this country. And then just a year or two years later, two years later, this came up. And we had to rethink. because And why I mentioned the ordination issue and my life being saved, when I say issue, the individual who tapped me on the shoulder didn't tell me this at the time, but he told others who said, Landis will never come. He's got too much going. The colleague who was Alan Handyside said, he's ordained. He'll go where the Lord calls him. And um, hmm. interestingly, other colleagues said, we envy you. Non-Seventh-day Adventist colleagues, we envy you. These are top cardiologists in the country. I said, why? I said, you have two Porsches. I didn't even have one. Uh, they said, we hate our work. This comes back a little to the question you asked. What is the benefit of having the pastoral component? Purpose. Fulfillment. Which goes beyond... Financial gain goes beyond professional standing, goes beyond academic fame, and embodies true fulfillment. Mm. And that's the benefit. So you've served now for 23 years. It's 2023, right? Yeah, well, yes. we, we, we were called in 2020, our uh, 2020. Uh, 2000, we got here because well, 9-11 took place. So the, the visa was a nightmare. But we came in on a green card in uh, 2020, uh, 2002. Okay. In March 2000, February 2002. But you've basically served now for over 20 yeah. years yeah. in for this position. Mm -hmm. What would you say has been the greatest privilege of serving as the Director of Health Ministries for the Seventh Amish Church globally? To get up in the morning and realize what a sacred trust to have the privilege of in some way guiding a grace-filled health message to God's Church. And through the church to the community. And that's the privilege. I love how you said the grace filled health message mm -hmm. to the church mm -hmm. and then to the community. And the reason why I love that is because sometimes we think that our diet maybe could save us, <laughs> um, or, you know, different, we believe so strongly in the health message, as we call it. But sometimes we forget that um, what the purpose of the health message is. You look like you wanted to say something, so I'm going to let you you're say ready. something. No, no, when you're ready, no, when you're ready. You said we believe so strongly. I disagree with you. Not because I want to disagree with you. That's okay. No, no, I have to though because we acquiesce to the health message. We accept it. You know, the devils believe and tremble. Hmm. About 30% of our world church even embrace some stripe of vegetarianism. 30%? We're not judged, nor are we saved by the food on our plate. 
But we have this amazing health message which gives us, and the science has robustly proven it, it gives us seven to nine years of extra life. And that's not only because of what we eat and don't eat and don't drink and don't smoke, but it's also the Sabbath, it's also the rest, it's also the relationships. All of those things, if you look at what are called the eight natural remedies, the trust in God, the temperance, which is not only not smoking or drinking, it's the balance. I feel like you're calling me out now, Peter. No, I'm calling myself out. I'm calling myself out. And that's why I said we acquiesce. But there's a knowledge, behavior, disconnect in my own life. Mm -hmm. So we know we have a health message. <laughs> and we do believe it. We do. And I, I think... We want to believe you it. You know, so I think I, I'm probably one of those people. I know we have a health message. I believe the health message, but my actions don't always reflect what my beliefs are. How do you help inspire church members like me? You're sitting across me, so pretend, so I am the listening audience. How do you help? What, what would you say to me? How do I transfer it from just head and the heart and, and get this beautiful holistic thing and actually put it into practice and not just believe it, the theory of it. I would say we need to understand why he gave us, why this church has been given the health message. Initially, it was given to us. I mean, throughout the theme of the Bible, from Genesis through Revelation, we see that there's a holistic approach to our being. We were cared for from creation physically, mentally, emotionally, relationally, spiritually, in the cool of the evening, God would come and speak to them. So all of those facets were cared for. It's been given to us because he loves us. We serve him because we love him. We don't avoid certain types of food in order to be saved. We adopt certain practices because we are saved. Because in that garment of his righteousness, there's not one thread of human devising, not one thread of Big Franks or veggie burgers or impossible or whatever there could be. And yes, we do have the privilege of knowing what is good and what is not so good. But what is going to stimulate me to accept and to follow that is to realize that he wants my best. He wants it because he loves me. And because I love him, I will do it. Don't misunderstand me. I'm not saying that when we fail and struggle as I do when I get on the scale in the morning and I hate the scale and I've lost and gained a ton over my life. I'm talking to my own heart today. What is going to make the difference is I'm going to have to say, Lord, I, sac I surrender this to you because I cannot do it alone. I am not the pantry patrol for the church. Good to know. Nor Although you could probably come and look in mine. There's not no, much in there right now. I have to I go grocery shopping. I want to tell you, <laughs> when I was pastoring a church, the, um, the number of people who were put off the health message by others who would see them in the supermarket and come and look into their, their checkout cart. Is it, oh, is this one? Oh. I've had those jokes before. I'm the, like, you true. feel so self-conscious. And it was like, I'm sorry, my daughter's having a birthday party. <laughs> Well, you want to be the health director for the church and they walk past you in the cafeteria. So so what are the health people eating today? <laughs> you know, well. <laughs> food. We're eating food. <laughs> well, but your question is, is, is so important and so pertinent. There are people in our church who believe that by keeping the health message, it ensures our salvation. That is not true. Salvation comes through faith in Christ alone, and that not of yourselves. Number two, Jesus' own words. It's not what goes in 
through the mouth that defiles it, what comes out. The saints don't always like to hear that. So the health message was given when Ellen White was asked, why was this church given a health message? She said, because our work is not yet done. It wasn't given so that we could be long-lived skinny sinners, but so that we can actually be fitted and continue to serve him. Hmm. And remember the 1863 vision came at a time when James White was struggling. And she says he could have lived much longer. Yep. And she writes around about the same time, the more perfect our health, the more perfect our service. On this earth, none of us is going to be perfect in our health, in our, in our brokenness. But we can have wholeness in our brokenness as we struggle with our, with our issues, with our, our exercise habits, our sleep, our balance, our nutrition. And he has promised, he said, I will be with you. So we need to take the health message. Uh, Ellen White writes in other places, his biddings are enablings. And say we take it to him and say, Lord, I'm struggling with this as I have done all my life. But I shudder to think of what my health would have been had I not embraced what he has shared with us. It's got to be looked at as a grace-filled gift. It's not, and Ellen White says, don't make health reform into health deform. Don't make it into a, an iron bedstead, cutting some off short and stretching others out. Those are the things we need to remember and then to take it as it is. It's a gift because he loves us. He wants us to have the best quality of life. He wants those nerve endings in our brains and in our body to be so finely tuned that we sense and understand what he's saying to us. I love that reframing. Um, as someone who has struggled with chronic illnesses mm -hmm. most of my life, I struggle with, mm -hmm. with weight. Mm -hmm. And I love the reframing of that. That really, I hate looking at a scale. I actually have gotten rid of it because it's, it just frustrates me. But I love the idea of reframing how I think about food and just health in general, that it's, that this is for his glory, it's, that it's, it's for us to fully be able to live the life that he has given us. And, and to stop thinking about how I look in an outfit or whether people are judging what's in my grocery cart and, and to just live the life so fully that he gave it and to give him the glory and the honor in all that I eat and drink, rest, sleep, sleep. I try, I try to, I do the sleep one really well. I <laughs> really like you. the sleep one. That's one I don't <laughs> struggle with. Um, You're lucky. Well, it's, it's one of the, one of my chronic illnesses is, um, um, fatigue related. And so I've realized that if I don't have an adequate amount of sleep, I actually am not the best mother and wife and worker that I want to be. And so that is one of those hard lines that I try to take as much as possible that I, I get my eight hours of sleep, even when it's not convenient, I will work very hard to get eight hours of sleep. It's not and always you're perfect. Doing, you're doing I do my well. best. Let me give you some encouragement. Because it encourages me. I don't know what whether you've, and, and I'm not advertising anything or talking about the theology or the role of apocryphal stories in the life of Jesus, but I watched the series called The Chosen. Mm -hmm. And there's a passage there, a portion, it's an apocryphal story where little James talks to Jesus. Uh, and James... This is how the story, I know this is not scriptural, but there's a precious lesson that uh, I've garnered from this. You've heard me talk about wholeness in brokenness. That's been a passion of mine since being in health ministries because we can only be whole in him. Paul said, 
my, you know, I, please take away the thorn and the flesh. And, and Christ said to him, my grace is sufficient for you because my strength is made perfect in weakness. So James, in a, in a one-on-one with Jesus, is purported to say, he said, Master, I want to talk to you. This thing of healing others, uh, and they see me walking. Can't you heal, heal me? I can't heal myself. And there's a tender conversation that takes place. And where ultimately Jesus says to him, Little James, you will be healed one day. But know that I trust you. So that when we go through these issues, you know, it's... It's a fallacy to think or for people to say or even to imagine on this earth, this broken planet, that if we eat enough totally vegetarian food, supplements, uh, exercise enough, sleep enough, that we're going to be perfect health. Our wholeness comes in Jesus. That's the wholeness. In brokenness. His strength is made perfect in my weakness. And the health message is when, when you look at the science related to proving how effective the health message is, as far as nutrition is, especially, but cigarette smoking, I mean, Adventists led the field in the understandings and also in, 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 in life expectancy related to not smoking and not taking alcohol, etc. But the health message gives us, regardless of our health, we can be being treated for cancer and if we follow the principles, we will still have better quality than if we didn't. It doesn't mean we'll get cure. Let's not confuse the two. The health message is preventive and it can ameliorate, it can lessen the issues of illness. But it's not always curative by any manner of means. And we need to understand that perspective. And then we also need to realize is that while we're on this earth, we face the issue of 6,000 plus years of genetic and other influences which don't make it easy. I wish we would have the perspectives that come from understanding adverse childhood events which make, you know, some people turn around and say, well, you know, I've lived this message all my life and uh, I've reached this ripe old age and I always ask them, how old were your parents? Oh, 101 and 105. So genes helped you a little bit too. (laughs) You know, it's not all that we do. Obviously, we have a role to play. We have given a responsibility. We've given information. And God has promised I will be with you. He has said to me, and I take this very seriously, it doesn't mean you'll never taste the nausea of chemotherapy or sense the sting of the scalpel or have the diagnosis which says you will not live more than a few weeks or months. But he has said, I will be with you. I will be with you. And if, you, if we take our time to look through the Bible and see where he has said to Joshua, be of good courage. No, be of very good courage because I am with you. Isaiah, when you go through the waters, I will be with you. When you go through the fire, where in Hebrews 13 it says, I will never leave you nor forsake you. Those are the prophets. Psalm 23. Yea, lo, yea, though I go through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil because why? You are with me. 
when you go through the landmine, maybe you'll, I'll spare you. I'll be able to spare you. Maybe my hands will be untied to spare you. That gives urgency to ministry. But the time will come when that's not going to happen. But he said, I'll be with you. And I think we need to realize that the health message is given for tremendous quality of life, for uh, for attaining and having wholeness in our brokenness. But one day it will all be made right. You know, I'm, a, I'm an emotional person. My children... You're in talk, good company. Talk about how I struggle often to get through a devotional thought or something without tearing up a little. But I'm like, if I, it, it is who I am. I think even are my Pathfinder kids, when I used to be a Pathfinder director, they, they one time a kid came and commended me for getting through talking about a devotional and not crying. Um, it's not like sobbing, but just when I talk yeah. about Christ, it's. It matters to me, especially when I'm trying to help others see him so passionately. And I think you've done what nobody has done so far on this. Um, You've actually made me cry. Um, And I've been kind of struggling here the last few minutes, like trying to get myself together here. Um, Because I think what you said was what so many people needed to hear. Because so many of us believe, but we struggle. And, And it's a... It's a hard road that we that we often walk because we want that instant healing. We want the the perfect scale numbers. We want the, all these perfect things, but we are broken people yeah. living in a broken world. Absolutely, that only God can fully fulfill. Absolutely. So thank you for joining me. I really privilege. appreciate it. We joy. hope you enjoyed this episode of ANN Profiles with my special guest and friend, Peter. If you haven't already, please take a moment and subscribe to this podcast or the YouTube channel, wherever it is you're tuning in from today. We don't want you to miss any future episodes. Thank you for spending this time with us. We know your time is precious. Join me next week as I continue to get to know the life stories of more inspiring people. <laughs>